Hey there, Kevin Schmidlin here, host of Philly Who with huge news. I am so excited to announce that the next live episode of Philly Who will take place on May 1st on the main stage of World Cafe Live. There, I'll sit down with Michael Salmanov and Steve Cook, the celebrity restaurateurs behind Zahav, Federal Donuts, Dizengoff, Abe Fisher, The Rooster, and Goldie. There, they'll tell the story of their journey to the top of the Philly food scene. Then, we'll be joined on stage by two previous Philly Who guests, Cake Life Bake Shop's executive pastry chef and Food Network star, Becca Craig, and Royal Sushi and Izakaya's sushi chef, Jesse Ito, who was recently named a James Beard Award finalist. They'll share updates to their stories since their episodes aired, and then I'll moderate a roundtable discussion between all four Philly food heavyweights about the Philadelphia food scene. If you join us, you'll be able to submit questions in advance, and you'll get a sneak peek taste from Cook and Solo's newest restaurant, which will be opening in June. Tickets go on sale to the public this Friday, but from today at 10 a.m. until Thursday at midnight, Philly Who listeners get exclusive first access. To get a ticket, head to the ticket link in the show notes or go to podphillywho.com forward slash live and use passcode podphillywho to get tickets. $5 for every ticket sold will support Broad Street Ministry and the rest of the proceeds will go directly to supporting this podcast. Oh, and by the way, this live show coincidentally falls on the eve of the one year anniversary of the launch of Philly Who. So it's going to be a party. Hope to see you there. You're listening to Philly Who, the podcast that tells the stories of the doers, thinkers, and performers of Philadelphia. My name is Kevin Schmidlin, and today I'm chatting with Kiera Smalls. Kiera is the executive director of Philly Startup Leaders, a nonprofit that connects Philly entrepreneurs to the resources they need to find success. Before joining PSL, Kiera founded City Fit Girls, a running and fitness community for Philly women. In this episode, she'll share how City Fit Girls was born after Kira lost 100 pounds. She and her best friends started hosting workouts with their friends, and then their friends' friends. And pretty soon, they had themselves a community. She hosted a run club from another part of the city, and they ran past us. And we still have this picture where our groups meet. And who knew? Like, that was the start of something amazing. She then went on to run marketing for Indigo, Philly's bike share program. While there, she introduced practices around diversity, equity, and inclusion that brought bike share to all neighborhoods in Philly and set ride share standards that are even being used today by Lyft. Okay, for our advertisements, let's make sure that it truly reflects the demographics of the city. The advertisements that Indigo rolled out eventually became a model for other programs in other cities. Today, she heads Philly Startup Leaders, where she currently works to help founders and technologists get connected to make their billion dollar business idea come to life. Maybe you don't know what an MVP is and you don't know what venture capital means, but you probably sitting on a great idea that we should put resources behind to help you get to the next level. So, Kiara Smalls has established herself as a leader in Philadelphia in multiple different categories. She's established a vibrant fitness community for women. She successfully brought inclusive marketing practices to Indigo, Philly's bike share program. And through Philly Startup Leaders, she's showing the Philly tech scene how to provide more opportunity to underserved founders and technologists. What these things all have in common and the foundation of her approach to life is empathy. But her original plan was not to become an expert in fostering community and connection. It was actually to become a social worker. That aspiration, though, was also the product of empathy. You see, as a child from West Philadelphia, Kira had spent time in the foster care system herself. I was a teenager growing up in, in West Philly again and wanted to hang out with as many friends and and hang out late night. And and my mother, correctional officer, you know, working them, I think, 3 to 11 p.m. shift. And when she called at 7 p.m. and her daughter was not in the house, she was worried, you know, as she should have been. 
And her response to to my youthfulness and my playfulness was, well, I'm worried and I don't know what'll happen to you while I'm not here to protect you. So I'm going to put you in placement. And so before I knew it, I was I was shipped off to Pottstown and Easton, Pennsylvania, and then a couple of years in group homes. And so I immediately said, I need to figure out a way to help as many kids as possible, not have to go through that. Was that traumatic in any way? Like, do you take any of that with you today? Absolutely. During the time, I didn't understand what the impact uh, those decisions had on me. I watched what that journey meant for how I showed up in friendships and interactions with authority. Uh, And then eventually as an adult uh, in relationships now, or at least for the past year, I've been in therapy to sort of unpack a lot of, of what you know, I went through as a child what it means, you know, today to be completely transparent. I used to speak of my upbringing as if it was a completely different person. And my therapist is the one who said, why are you talking about your childhood as if it's someone else? And I didn't realize what I was doing was suppressing that part of my life because I didn't want it to to dictate what I wanted to become and what I was striving for. And so I kind of left it alone, lock and key. And thankfully, my therapist was super supportive and did her job right to to help me navigate, you know, what that what those situations meant then and what they mean now. You know, in that previous definition that you had of the two different people, at what point did you switch from being that person to being the, the adult, I guess? I would say a few years ago when we started implementing mental health, mental health awareness activities with City Fit Girls. So so I co-founded City Fit Girls with a best friend of mine um, a couple of years ago, and we helped women prioritize physical and mental health. But earlier on, we just focused on physical health. And then when the online community started growing and our group activities and person activities started thriving, we started to talk a little bit more openly and honestly about who we really are. And in doing so, it opened up a lot of opportunities for women in our network to also share who they truly were. And so it became this network of, hey, if we're going to be a part of this community, this community is welcoming, inviting to everyone and anyone, regardless of their background, socioeconomic status. And how can we make sure that we are being authentic in our journey to live in a healthier lifestyle? And so in preaching that, I also had to practice it. And so as I was training for races, training for my first marathon, and doing all of these things, there was still this quote-unquote burden of my past that still showed up in different areas. And and at first, I didn't want to address it. I was just like, maybe I'm just stressed. And then, you know, maybe I'm overthinking. And so I still kept those thoughts kind of in the back seat, But opening up the City Fit Girls community to mental health awareness and opening up myself allowed me to to become a little bit more accepting of my past. And then thanks to therapy, it not only became an acceptance, but then also an opportunity for me to truly reflect yeah. and and think about, again, what what did that really do for young Kier and what does that do for the Kier right. today? Let's back up to... You eventually attended school at Westchester. Yeah. And you would graduate in 2011 with a degree in sociology and African American studies, but you started with criminal justice? Correct. So you, you wanted, did you want to be a corrections officer like your mother? So I wanted to be a social worker, and it was inspired by my mother being a correctional officer. And so I went to Westchester University, started studying criminal justice, and eventually I did an internship at a social services agency. And that was eye-opening for me. I was able to shadow an individual who had a lot of cases, right? Meaning like had a lot of youth that they had to look after um, in their families. And I would watch week to week, there would be some successes for some families and then there would be challenges and setbacks for others. And regardless of the outcome, that social worker had to keep going. For me, it was eye-opening because the system you know, criminal justice system is super complex. And there are a lot of things broken, you know, as I think a lot of us know. And I said to myself, you know what, 
I don't want to go into my first career as a social worker and get that revolving door of stress. Now, every job can have a revolving door of stress, but that internship made me to think a little bit more intentionally around like what impact I wanted to have. So I ended up working in human resources at a social services agency. So I said, well, I don't necessarily, I'm not ready to be a social worker right now, but I can hire the right people and get some good quality people in this social services agency to be impactful to the youth that we were serving. Wow. Sometimes it's more important getting an internship to find out what you don't want than what it is that you actually yes, want, right? <laughs> absolutely. So were there any other moments early on in your college career that, that defined your journey? Freshman year of college, right before winter break, my mother fell into a coma and she passed away eventually due to drug addiction. Here I am as a freshman in college and I'm dealing with the loss of my mother. When you know you mentioned trauma earlier on and it's so interesting because my mother always struggled with drugs my entire life and even before I was born and so I always had to watch her navigate that struggle and growing up I always thought it was her issue and I I used to say this is your fault you know I used to blame my mother for her addiction not knowing what I know today about what addiction does to a person and so freshman year, I had to live with the fact that I no longer had my mom, you know, where when you grow up, your mom's supposed to see you graduate, maybe go to your wedding if that's what you choose to do. And here I am with my older sister, two years older than me, and we have to figure out how to navigate life without our mother. So when life just stops like that, what do you do? So two things. We sort of got a warning. Okay. Maybe a year before when my mother relapsed and did drugs again, a doctor said to her, if you do it again, that's it. And when you hear that, you're like, how, how do you know? What do you mean? And unfortunately, it was actually true. And so our family was not totally surprised mm -hmm. that my mother passed away due to doing drugs again. At the time that this happened, this was over winter break, my freshman year of college, and then spring Semester starts again, and in order to remain an active student, I need to go back to school. And so the grieving time was very short uh, in terms of being home with my family. I mean, they also had to go on with their lives, and, and that's what a lot of us have to do when we lose a loved one. And so I get back to school, and I just have to get back into the swing of things, right? So I take about, I think, probably five, six classes to, to stay busy, get involved in all the leadership programs or anything to get my mind on something more positive than the fact that I just lost my mother. I did not totally accept the fact that my mother passed away until probably last summer. So... Meaning, again, I initially said, like, this is your fault. And then, uh, thankfully, I started reading. Uh, his name is Dr. Gabar Mati. And someone recommended a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts. And it talks about addiction and how it shows up for individuals and how it could show up drug-related, but also even work-related. Right. And, and in our social settings and doing some research and reading a lot of his writing, I made peace with the fact that my mother was not in control of her addiction. Yeah. And as much as she wanted to to do right, as much as she, you know, wanted to live a life filled with love, happiness, hope, I mean, like we all do, right. she did not have all the tools at her disposal to do that. And it started when she was very young. I didn't accept it or spend time with it until last summer, but I... I moved past it by becoming super busy yeah. and staying away from drugs, yeah. to be completely honest. So were you interested in mental and physical wellness at this point in college, or had you not discovered it yet? I was interested in physical health during college. So again, another form of keeping busy. Yeah. I found myself working out every morning, eat breakfast, go to classes. I did not prioritize or think about mental health until after I graduated college, honestly. I eventually started meeting people who talked a lot about mental health. And 
you know, initially I, was, I thought you seek therapy because something's wrong. I think a lot of people do. And, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. And so thankfully, again, I have some friends and some family who were able to support me and and actually ask me to think about the impact that a lot of my challenges when I graduated college, think about what they had uh, on my mental health. And then that, coupled with creating City Fit Girls, got me inspired. Yeah, so let's go right there. Tell me about the moments that the idea of City Fit Girls started to appear in, in your mind. Was it with your co-founder, Takia? Were you guys just running partners and then said, hey, we need more of this? Or, or how did that come to be? So in college, uh, closer to senior year, I was continuing on my weight loss journey. I started to say, okay, I can do all these workouts, but I am eating poorly. And during college, Takia, my best friend, Takia McClendon, she said, listen, how about I help you with nutrition? I've been researching a lot about food justice and nutrition education. I'm happy to help, right? So she's not a registered dietitian. She's just a best friend, you know, who right. cares about her her friend. And so we talked about veganism. And now this was eight years ago. Yeah. And so not that many people, especially black people, were talking about veganism. Not so mainstream. <laughs> and we did. And eventually between a uh, plant-based lifestyle and working out, I had lost close to 100 pounds. Wow. My friends and family, they were like, what did you do? What's your secret? Right, right. <laughs> oh, my God. And so I said, well, I was working out. Yeah. And I became vegan. Yeah. And so they're like, well, I'm not becoming vegan. I don't even, wanna, I don't even know what that is. I don't want to have that conversation. But they were super interested in us helping them with physical wellness. Right. So we started City Fit Girls by hosting different boot camps throughout the city. And so at the time, I lived in Germantown and started hosting workouts in Germantown. And then at the same time, our online community started growing and women in the city wanted to learn more. And at first, it was just like kind of close friends and family. And then Instagram kind of started blowing up and people were like, hey, I want to come to this. It's like, hey, who are you? Yeah. (laughs) Um, That must have been such a cool moment when you had strangers reaching out. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool. And so then we transitioned from hosting in Germantown to the art museum area because it was accessible yeah. for parking purposes for people um, and also a familiar place for people. And then the steps, you know, you can work yeah. out on the steps. Yeah. You don't even need to bring equipment. And so we started hosting boot camps in, in the art museum area. And then eventually Takia said, hey, I want to introduce a run club component to City Fit Girls. And I said, okay, you do that over there. <laughs> I'll stick to boot camps. Yeah. I've only ran when I was running from something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not for the fun of it. And so I remember hosting a boot camp, and she hosted a run club from another part of the city, and they ran past us. And we still have this picture where our groups meet, and we take this picture. And who do Like, that was the start of something amazing for us, really. Uh, we decided to incorporate a weekly run club. And so today we get anywhere between, let's say, 30 to 40 runners in a winter, but up to 100 women every Wednesday in the summer. Wow. And we host boot camps during the warmer months. And then we also host private workouts to introduce women in our network to the different studios and gyms around the city. We also have chapters in different cities. We know how much fitness has impacted us on our personal journey uh, and then what we were able to do with our close friends and family. And here's an opportunity for us to do something for an entire city. For a lot of us, it's community. I just I just want to be around others who, who also practice what they preach or at least try to practice what they preach with regard to prioritizing their physical health and, and a sense of belonging. And so, yeah, we're still very active and in our community. Growing up, I actually myself lost 80 pounds and I would get the same question where it was, you know, what's the secret? (laughs) And you're like, the secret is there is no secret. It's exactly (laughs) what you think it is. It's diet and good exercise. Yeah. And what I love is that you guys decided to, because I was just like, go figure it out. But you guys actually built a community around it and showed (laughs) people how to do it. It's it's great. And, And I've also been thinking about that too lately. Like I have some friends who I love dearly, but everything that we do whenever we hang out, it's surrounded around like eating poorly or drinking or, or things like that. It's so valuable to have a community of friends where you're brought together and encouraged to do something that's 
healthy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? healthier. Yeah, and you absolutely. Guys have all that with City Fit Girls. It's it's awesome. Thank you. Another caveat to City Fit Girls is we also started it because we wanted to create a welcoming and inclusive community for women. When I started my weight loss journey or fitness journey, and then Takia was supporting me, we also spent time to go to different studios around the city or different group fitness workouts, and we didn't see people who look like us, and whether it was color or shape or um, age and gender. And so when we created City for Girls, we said we want this to be a welcoming, inclusive community for women to feel comfortable, to show up as their whole selves, and help each other along our journey to physical and mental happiness. Yeah. So that touches upon something that I discussed with Leonzo Vargas in a past episode. He's the founder of Global Village, and he, and he talks about that as well. Uh, Global Village is a uh, urban wellness company. He says the same thing. Like if you Google mental wellness, you see the same people in every ad. You see that trend also in your work, the, the whole idea of you need to see people who look like you, not only there, but also in the marketing you also brought that idea to bike share when you worked at Indigo. Now, did you notice that from City Fit Girls and and be able to bring it into this job as marketing for Indigo? Like, how did that? How did you get into market? Uh, lead a marketing team? Like, I haven't heard marketing yet <laughs> in your journey. So, so what's the story there? I had a friend reach out and say, "Hey, Philadelphia is launching a new bike share program, and they need a marketer. And you have done great work with Takia to build City Fit Girls." organically. And so consider applying. And at the time, I transitioned from my HR job and was doing City Fit Girls full time. So I wasn't necessarily looking. But then I said, who wouldn't want to be a part of changing transportation in a major city? Right. Yeah. (laughs) And so I applied. And it was interesting because in the interview, they referenced City Fit Girls. They referenced City Fit Girls Instagram and the community and said, listen, we are launching Bike Share and we need to build a sense of community around the Bike Share program here. And I got the position and I started as a, maybe a marketing coordinator and then eventually grew to marketing manager overseeing um, all of marketing for Indigo as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, not only for Philadelphia, but then for the other bike share programs that the startup I yeah. worked for, where they also manage bike share programs. So it was Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and Oklahoma City. Right. Why did they know to put you in charge of that? So with Indigo, Indigo had an amazing opportunity thanks to a grant. I think it was a $3 million grant at the time. I know it's grown, it's grown since then to implement equity initiatives to ensure that Philadelphia's ridership reflects the demographics of the city. So that included where certain stations were placed, the marketing and advertising, the opportunity to have partnership programs and ambassador programs to truly make sure that communities felt that bike share was for them. And that was a learning experience for all of us. There were some hard conversations. Tell me about one. Okay, there was a time where a community said, we don't want bike share. That's a sign of gentrification. That is not for us. And here we are, a diverse team saying, we promise you it's for you. We literally have a grant to make sure that it's for you. We have done some internal work and trainings on ourselves, as well as partner with other cities and initiatives to make sure that we can work with the community to implement the program so it's less hey we're bringing this thing to you but hey we want to bring this program to you how can we do that and so what started as a really hard conversation at first became oh okay bike share is for us they are inviting us to the table early on they are bringing potential job opportunities this is not just a commuter program i can use this for recreation and what I think I see as valuable for this program versus what they want to tell me is valuable. And a lot of that work was due to us doing focus groups, again, having hard conversations, testing ideas that didn't make sense at the time, but is a no-brainer today. Sorry, I got to ask that. Is there an example of an idea that was that is a no-brainer today but didn't feel right at the time? So bike share industry, bike industry, it's very white male dominated, and you typically don't see different kinds of people, you know, biking. And so for Indigo, some of the things that we initiated through our focus groups was, okay, for our advertisements, 
let's make sure that it truly reflects the demographics of the city. And so we had participants say, I want to see people with weave wearing a helmet. I want to see people in the hood. I don't want to see this cleaned up, you know, um, advertisement. And then that's your way of selling me on this. And so the advertisements that Indigo rolled out eventually became a model for other programs in other cities. Another thing, too, is Indigo was the first to launch a program for anyone who was on uh, public assistance, right? So you maybe have EBT, food stamps. You get a different price for your pass. This is not necessarily a discount. To be clear, this is we're going to meet you where you are with how much you earn. And so this is how much your pass is going to cost. And then we watched, again, this be implemented into other bike share programs. And today, Lyft and Uber has acquired some programs across the country, and Lyft is actually piloting a similar program. Wow, that's such a game changer. Years ago, we didn't know that. And then eventually, a lot of these changes started happening. Any bike share program that launched after 2015 mirrored something related to Indigo Bike Share. Wow, you must feel proud. I am so proud. I am so happy for the the teams that were a part of the launch and that are still there today. There was a lot of work that went into making sure that Indigo was reflective of the demographics of the city. I think that they've done a great job. Yeah. Is there more work? Of course. There's more work for every we're everything we do. However, to see a lot of our work be mirrored in other cities, and they may not necessarily even know that Philly is the one who did it first, uh, but it's inspiring to see, absolutely. And then see how that has the work has went from not only the bike industry, but then the tech industry and all other industries as well. Coming up, we'll talk about how Kiera would make her way into the tech scene by becoming the executive director of Philly Startup Leaders. And she and I will dive into her thinking on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how she helps underrepresented Philly founders take their billion dollar idea and make it come to life. Stay tuned. This episode of Philly Who is supported by The Civic, an adaptive reuse apartment building at 16th and Girard. The Civic is named after Teddy Roosevelt's speech, Citizenship in the Republic, and is designed around the idea that good citizenship starts with embracing and representing the people around you. That's why it includes connection-inspiring amenities, such as its art collection, fitness center, roof deck, on-site retail, and yoga room. To learn more, to book a tour, or to just thank them for supporting Philly Who, you can visit thecivicphl.com forward slash Philly Who. The link is in the show notes. Welcome back to Philly Who with Kiara Smalls. Let's jump right back in. Well, speaking of the tech industry, you continued your journey of connecting people and community to resources by joining Philly Startup Leaders as executive director. Now, you did that at a time when Philly Startup Leaders was in the news and its diversity inclusion practices were under heavy scrutiny by the public. Now, when you took that role, did you feel a lot of pressure immediately by this attention? No. I was actually excited. Coming from the work that I did at City Fair Girls to create a community that was inclusive and welcoming and inviting that was very different than what the wellness industry was portraying. And then from the bike share industry to help make sure that Philadelphia's ridership was reflective of the demographics of the city when the bike industry showed something different. The opportunity to try to do the same work in the tech industry, knowing that the tech industry was different, I was energized by it. When some people may quote unquote run away from the fire, I'm interested in running towards it. The beauty of all of this is that there was no actual fire. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of times it's just hard conversations that need to happen, mistakes that may happen, um, and and learning opportunities for, for a lot of people. It's so important for communities to learn, right? Yep. To, to have experienced uncomfortable things so that they know, <laughs> you know, and so that they can be aware of mistakes they may be making you know, even elsewhere in life, you know, it's so important to learn from those types of things. What's a sign that you look for in a company or or an organization that actually proves that they care about this and that they're not just kind of saying it, you know? I really appreciate that question. 
when they are always talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, is it for show and lip service, or are they truly making a change, whether it's within their company or to inspire change with other groups or organizations that they have influence over? And so what comes to mind is not only what you do public facing, but also what you do behind closed doors. So I have been in conversations where something was said that does not reflect the diversity and inclusion conference they just held. (laughs) I'm at a place now where I'm going to say something. You know, I think a lot about people who don't have the opportunity to voice their opinions or be connected to leaders who are empowered to, to really help them understand why what they do in private is equally harmful um, to what they do in public uh, if it's not correlated. That actually inspired me to write a Medium article titled Why We Need Empathy in Order to Prioritize Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Tech, which is truly every industry, really. And it outlines, listen, this is why. And I think I think more people know why lack of diversity, equity, and inclusion is an issue. The challenge, or rather the opportunity, is what can we do about it? And what can we do that's truly impactful, you know, beyond hosting a panel, beyond adding a black or brown person to to the cover of your ad on something? How can we truly practice what we preach with regard to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And so that article kind of gave some pointers and it was really written for the person who needs the support. It's surrounded by empathy, which sounds like it kind of is the what and the how, right? If you could just think, just think outside of your own box, right? Yep. And we we like to listen to the individuals who speak on these topics. I mean, people speak very well on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so the challenge is truly... How can we meet people where they are and give them the information they need? And sometimes it is going to be challenging to try to convince someone of why other people matter. Yeah. It's basic. And so I'm interested in just continuing to have the hard conversations. And I'll give you an example. <laughs> there is an organization that is hosting maybe monthly lunch events with leaders in the city. And they sent their schedule out for the next six months. And every month there was a white male. And I said, hey, happy to send you recommendations of people of color, of women. And the response was, you know, we really want to make sure that they're leaders, you know, not like VP of marketing and then I, I shared my article. <laughs> I said, I, as you can imagine, for various reasons, and I linked my article, why people of color and women may not have top leadership positions in the city or maybe, I mean, in any city. Also, there are yeah, yeah, people yeah, of yeah. color and women in leadership positions. So then the, the individual sent me back a long list of people and added a phenomenal uh, woman leader to that list and and you know I hope that the list continues to diversify. So I was going to ask cuz we've mentioned a couple times or you've mentioned a couple times in the conversation so far hard conversations. It sounds like the approach that you took this time was just sort of calm, provide help, provide resources, try to lead the horse to water and hope for the best. Is that what you would recommend? I think that there are multiple ways of doing things. The way that I have found success, uh, whether it was with the person or just with myself (laughs) and and navigating a challenge is by listening to understand and not just listen to respond. There are just so many people that just don't have access, will never have access to opportunities to help them with their quality of life. And so I keep that in the back of my mind when I'm talking to people, especially people who, let's just say, just don't get it. So I enter a conversation and I say, okay, if I hear you correctly, this is what you want to accomplish. This is how you think this should be. Here's what else needs to happen in order to truly make this effective. Here's what I can do to support you. Here are some other resources in the city or or online that can support you as well. 
And so that's how I operate. And again, I think it's case by case. Is it someone or or an organization that just continuously just doesn't get it? At Westchester University, Takia and our friend Mark, they were running for um, homecoming king and queen as part of the Black Student Union and won. And every year, the newspaper highlights the homecoming king and queen on the front. And that particular year, there was nothing about homecoming king and queen anywhere in this newspaper. And, I mean, we were very upset and we wanted to, like, storm up to the newsroom and just say, we don't understand. What was different, you know, from years of highlighting the biggest activity on this campus? And we knew what it was, which made it even worse. And their excuse was, oh, we had a new intern that didn't really know what they were doing. And, you know, for a lot of people, especially black or brown people, I mean, the excuses are just exhausting. And there are a lot of people who will not go the route of I'll meet you where you are. I'll have the conversation just because it's exhausting. And and maybe they've tried it before and know that it doesn't work. And so they have other ways of getting across what they need to get across or getting accomplished what they need to accomplish And for from where I sit in my role right now, I'm going to have a conversation with you. I'm going to be real with you. Uh, I expect the same back. And how do we make this a learning moment for all of us? What's your vision for Philly startup leaders and the Philly tech scene in the next, what, 5, 10, 20, 200 years? What do you think? Wow. Maybe not 200, (laughs) but, you know, you pick the time frame. So I would like to see the Philadelphia startup scene reflect the demographics of the city just as... I did and my team did with Indigo and the ridership reflecting the demographics of the city. And it's going to take a lot of unconventional ways of doing that. And it's going to be a combination of opportunities and hard conversations, as I always say, to to make sure that that's true. And so what comes to mind for me in the immediate is how can we make sure that individuals from marginalized groups know that they can they may be potentially sitting on a million dollar billion dollar idea and and this ecosystem is there to help them parse it out and support them along their journey to turn in that idea into a reality and there is a lot of energy right now around workforce development and i think that's great um definitely what can we do to give people tools that they need in order to be successful in careers I also don't want us to assume that um, individuals in marginalized groups aren't capable or qualified to do things. I think that that's just a, a terrible assumption based on lack of exposure and access. And so how can we as a tech scene make sure that we're providing opportunities and respecting individuals of different backgrounds to join in and to this growing, amazing ecosystem? You know, so for us at Philly Startup Leaders, I mean, we introduce founders one on one and and those are for folks. Maybe you don't know what an MVP is and, and you don't know what what, it, you know, venture capital means. But you probably sitting on a great idea that we should put resources behind to help you get to the next level. And so, again, uh, I think the next five, 10 years, we're going to see a more diverse tech scene and a thriving tech scene because of it. And we're going to see Philadelphia truly become the city that it's meant to become. What would you say is a common misconception about yourself? Two things come to mind. I think one is that maybe I'm all over the place with like my career trajectory, right? I started in HR and fitness, wellness, and then bike share, and now in tech, (laughs) marketing. I mean, there's just so much. And for me, I like being a jack of all trades. I like having my hand and and a bunch of different you know places and and projects because I want to have a big perspective of what is happening in the city, what could happen in the city, and how I could be a part of it. Yeah. And again, in everything I've done, I'm always looking to connect available resources to the people who need it the most. It has just been in different industries. Right. It's funny. I think some people do get worried when their resume isn't like you know, homogenous. And it's like, that's a leadership resume when you have marketing and tech and, 
you know, journalism, WHYY, like all these yeah. different things. Like that's a CEO resume right there. So <laughs> <laughs> don't let anybody tell you that that's not good. <laughs> What's the other piece? I think the other one is I'm a big dreamer, big thinker. I, we're always talking about, um, like think outside the box yeah. and I promise you there is no box in my mind uh -huh. at all and I mean that wholeheartedly and so for me whether it's a challenge or or something positive I'm always thinking like okay what else do we need to do who's missing what does this mean now what does this mean next year what does this mean in five years and it may kind of just be all in my mind <laughs> I kind of like having a little naivete and and not just sticking to old systems, old ways of doing things, um, or, you know, just because someone's this age or I'm that age or someone has this experience and I'm that experience that I, that doesn't limit me and I would never want it to limit me or anyone else. Yeah. And so. I mean, naivety and optimism go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Uh, if you could send a message to yourself in the past at any point, butterfly effect aside, right? So nothing's going to change. What, at what point would you send it? What would you say? It would be the summer before I go to college. And it would be a heads up that your family dynamic is going to change drastically in a few months. You are not going to understand why, how, and the impact it has on you. But it will pause you in your tracks, um, have you question a lot of things, um, and have you think that it's the end of the road as you know it, but it's not. And it'll, it'll be an opportunity for you to grow through it. And by it, I'm talking about the passing of my mom. Grow through these challenges in order to become someone that can navigate challenges um, in a way that, that works for your mental health, as well as support others through their challenges as well. At the beginning of the conversation, you said a couple of times how it was just this past summer that you felt that you started to understand the need for mental health and I guess work on it. Was there some sort of epiphany that led you to that? Mental health awareness, it has always been something that has come to mind for the past couple of years. But then last summer, through a lot of therapy work, I was able to accept a lot in my past, including my mother's passing. So then through therapy and then the research of Dr. Gabar Mati in the realm of hungry ghosts, I was able to prioritize mental health in a different way, and I would say in a better way that allowed me to not only just become more accepting of it for myself, but then help me better navigate mental health challenges and then also support others who have challenges around their mental health as well. Yeah. Final question. If you had one message that you can get to every Philadelphian, whether it's a tweet, a text, a plane in the sky, a billboard, whatever, one thing that each and every Philadelphian could truly ponder, what would you say? What have you done or what will you do today to support someone else? And so I think about Martin Luther King's quote, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And that's what I would want to ask everyone in Philadelphia. For more on Kiera, City Fit Girls, and Philly startup leaders, you can head to podphillywho.com forward slash Kiera. That's K-I-E-R-A. As always, if you like the show, be sure to subscribe and give us a rating if you're on Apple Podcasts. You can follow along on Twitter and Instagram at PodPhillyWho. And for Philly Who news and announcements, or to keep up with the stories of previous guests of the show, you can join the email newsletter via PodPhillyWho.com forward slash email. Philly Who is a Q9 production. This episode's associate producer is Angela Gervasi, with editing by Max Graham, music by Lee Rosevere, and artwork by Lauren Carhart. For Philly Who, my name is Kevin Schmidlin. Till next time. <laughs>